Okay, so uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Canvas today, and so I want to jump right into it. Uh, a little obligatory about me, uh, I'm Jason Waters, uh, 15 years of experience developing software. Uh, I'm one of the organizers for the AngularJS Utah Meetup here. Uh, I'm really excited about JavaScript. Uh, I love Python, tacos, and my family. Not exactly in that order, perhaps, but I like all of those things. And uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Jason Waters. I don't know. Does that help? Crank it up to 11. Hello? Better? OK. So I want to apologize up front. This talk is not about Angular. My deepest apologies. I hope that you'll take the next 30 minutes with me and indulge in a little vanilla JavaScript. And then Maureen will take you through a journey of Angular again. So Canvas. What is Canvas? Well, as we can see here, it's white, rectangular, waiting for you to paint onto it. Actually, it's just like that in uh, HTML5 as well, just like True to life, it's waiting for an artist to leave his mark uh, or a programmer to script something beautiful. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with SVG. I wanted to take a minute to talk about the differences. So Canvas is all bitmap graphics. You're actually going to modify pixels and draw onto a Canvas element in HTML. SVG is vector-based. So since we're in the Adobe building, we could say Canvas is like Adobe Photoshop. SVG is Adobe Illustrator. Uh, the Canvas is a single element that you can draw to. SVG, it actually has an inspectable DOM structure all in XML. Uh, so if you right-click in some chart or graph, you can see a structure and actually change properties on there and, and inspect that. It's a little bit more difficult with Canvas because if you inspect that, you just see an element that magically has a bunch of stuff on it. Uh, the nice thing about each of these things is that you can programmatically uh, manipulate them with JavaScript. Browser support. Canvas is supported on all major browsers, especially Evergreen. If you are sadly supporting IE8, I'm sorry. Uh, however, there are polyfills available. Uh, it's not ideal. They will backfill to Flash or Silverlight. But if you're stuck in IE8 world, it could be an option. Some use cases for Canvas. It's becoming pretty popular these days. Uh, when I got my start in software development, I was actually a Flash guy. I know Flash is a four-letter word now, so don't hate. Uh, it's, it's over now for me. But I did a lot of games back in the day with Flash, and a lot of other people did too. Nowadays, not so much. People are using Canvas to write games. Canvas is perfect for image editing. If you're building something and you want people to manipulate some pixels, uh, maybe crop an avatar or manipulate a t-shirt design, Canvas is a great fit. And then uh, SVG is also a great fit here. It's usually the go-to for data visualization, but Canvas is a good option as well. And you can draw some beautiful charts and graphs with it and actually get some performance gains as well. So without further ado, I'd like to jump in and do a little bit of live coding. I think that's going to be the fastest intro for all of us to see just what this Canvas stuff is all about. So like I said, Canvas, big 
rectangular and white. In this case, I've used a little uh, CSS to draw a border around it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see it. So let's go into some of the basics. If you're going to manipulate the canvas, first thing you need to do is get the canvas element. Can everybody see that OK, or is it too small? It's OK? OK. So we get the canvas, but we can't draw directly to this canvas now that we have the element. Instead, we have to get the context. So we can do that by saying canvas get context. And it's, this takes a parameter. So you can put in what we're going to do today is, and it has to be a lowercase 2d. We're going to get the 2d rendering canva, uh, context of the canvas so we can draw two dimensionally. You can also put in a WebGL, for example, and do some 3D rendering. I'm not going to talk about that today, but there's a lot of good resources you can look at later, or maybe a future uh, speaker. So we've got our context. I think the first thing anybody should ever draw on a canvas when they're starting out is a rectangle. So let's do that. Oops. So if you do fill rect, then you pass in an x and y coordinate and a width and a height. Now I should note that in a canvas, there is a coordinate system. And in the top left is where 0, 0 is. So the bottom right, in this case, I didn't point out in my HTML, but I've instantiated, I've defined the canvas with a width of 400 and 400. So that's what the bottom right corner is. So if I say fill rect 0, 0, 100, 100, boom. We've got our, we've got our rectangle. Yes. So uh, once you've drawn something, oh, by the way, it's a little boring. So let's say context fill style. And this will take any CSS valid um, color. So you can put in a hex code. I don't speak hex very well, so I'm just going to say, how about that one? There we go. So it's kind of interesting because you, it's like, if you're thinking about a real life canvas, it's like you've got a paintbrush. You're going to dip it in the red paint. Then you're going to fill. And that's what we did here. So when you have a something drawn on the canvas, the next obvious thing to do is to clear the canvas, right? Do that easy enough. Clear rect. I'm just going to put some magic numbers in here. And there we go. So in this case, it drew the square and then it cleared it. Let's pull that out and make it a function. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it would. For the sake of time, I won't do it, but you can you can clear just a portion. Yeah. So we've drawn a square and we have cleared it. I think the next thing let's let's move up the complex the complexity here. API. Let's draw a arc or a circle. So in this case, parameters are an x and a y. I'm going to specify 200 and 200 right in the middle. Once a radius. So if any of you are trigonometry or geometry wizards, you're going to love Canvas. It's going to be great. And then it takes an angle and an end angle. So in our example, I'm going to say, I want a circle here, 200, 200 in the middle, with a radius of 50. And so it's going to start here. And then start starting angle, I'll put 0. And it'll begin drawing clockwise a circle. So starting angle 0, let's put in math.pi. 
dealing in radians here. And I've saved. It's not drawing anything. Actually, it did do something. It plotted that arc on the page, but it's not visible to us because we have to do context.fill. So there we go. We've got a semicircle, and it did go in the, in the clockwise direction, just like we said, from 0 to pi. It, the last argument here is anti-clockwise. So we could say true and see that it draws a circle the other way, a semicircle. So in this case, let's do 0 to 2 pi, and now we've got our circle. And of course, we can change the fill style. And there we go. Now, we could fill, or we could also, instead of fill, we could do context.stroke. And instead of filling that circle, just stroked the circle. And another thing to point out is if I take out this clear, let's change this to be um, 300 and 300 so our square is a little bit bigger. You can see that it drew this, it, it, its order is in order of drawing. So it drew the square, then it drew the circle. If the circle was drawn before, you know, intuitively, it would be behind the square. And that's how it works. So what's the next basic thing? Uh, let's do text. Starting to see a pattern here, I think. Fill rect, fill, fill text. Uh, you could say stroke text as well. So in this case, we'll say hello world and give it an x coordinate and a y coordinate. We have liftoff. <laughs> okay. Hello world. Perfect. Although we kind of want to change that. You probably can't read it very well. So if we say context dot font, now let's say 48 pixels Arial. It's much bigger now. Move it to the left. So you can do text too. Text isn't the best fit for Canvas. It's not recommended, especially when text is a, is it works great in HTML. If you see some game written in Canvas and there's a lot of text, most likely they're overlaying some HTML with text on top because performance will be a lot better. But you can do it. All right. So we've we've done a rectangle, a circle, some text. Next thing I think we ought to do is an image. You can draw an image, an image to the canvas. First, we'll load one in. Okay, so I'm going to put an on load. So when this image is loaded, then we'll tell the context to draw image. There's actually a lot of different parameters you can pass in here. For this example, we can what we're going to tell it is take this image, draw it, this x and y, this width and height. JK, what did I do wrong here? Oh, yep. You have to specify the image. I'm surprised you guys didn't catch that for me. There we go. We've got our plumber. So one other thing that you can do with draw image, and I don't know if you can see this hinting from WebStorm, but you can specify a source um, coordinates, width and height, and a destination coordinates. So that makes it, everyone in here is probably familiar with uh, 
um, sprites, CSS sprites. So you can do that. That's how when you see a game and you see a character on there and he's animating, it's because they have a sprite sheet that they're copying different frames from and putting it onto the canvas. So it looks like he's running or, or whatever he's doing. So that's pretty powerful. OK. So. Uh, yeah, but I didn't prepare that for the demo, so okay. that's some personal homework for you. Right. Yes, you can. <laughs> you know what, I'm going to clear this because I just remembered that there is one more thing that you can do. Oops. Oh, it's drawing Mario on top because of the onload. Cool. I'll cheat. Okay, so... Uh, you can draw a path. So if we do context.beginPath, we're, we're about to tell it, let me give you a little more space here, that we want it to kind of freehand draw something. So begin the path, context. Uh, you'd think it would be end path. But the API designers were way smarter than me, so they called it close path. Makes perfect sense. So now if you imagine... Uh, I'm saying begin path. I want you to take a pen onto this canvas and start to draw. So first, move the pen to a certain coordinate. So context, uh, move to, and let's put in 200, 200. That seems to be my favorite. So I'm saying go to the center and then do something. And then I'm going to say start drawing a line. Do a line to coordinate 300, 300. So it's going to start in the middle, go down and to the right. Then do another line. And we'll say uh, back to 200, 400 Y. And of course, we have to do context.fill again. Anybody know what this is going to draw? Apparently nothing. That's cool. What? Oh, I bet you it cleared it because of this. I'm going to just... There we go. Here we go. Look, we drew a triangle. Sweet. So that's how you can actually draw all kinds of creative, crazy shapes using this pattern. You specify a path, and then you plot a bunch of different coordinates for it. OK, so we've got the basics. I wanted to spend a little bit of time having some fun. So let's go to that. We're going to build a little something. This is something I might have built in high school or something it's to amuse myself. So it'll be useless, but exciting. Uh, you can see that I've done a little bit of setup. Nothing you haven't seen. I'm, I'm getting the canvas. I've set up the context. I'm storing, I like to refer to the canvas as a stage that actors can be on, for example. I'm, I'm storing the stage width and height, so I can reuse that later. I've still got the clear method that we have we did last time. And then you often want to create some type of abstraction so you're not dealing with the metal of Canvas. It becomes kind of annoying. So if you abstract it out a little, it makes it easier on yourself. And a little bit later, I'll show you some of the libraries and frameworks that do that for you. So let's get started. In general, I like to have a function that does the work. So we'll call that function. And in there, we'll call draw circle. 
this abstraction allows me to say an x, y, and a radius, and a color. So in this case, we'll say, why not my, well, no, we're going to switch it up a little. Yes. OK, great. Demo over. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. So we're drawing, but if you've got a canvas and you want to do something cool instead of just draw it and leave it there, you want to draw and draw and draw a little bit more. So in this case, we can say window dot set interval draw one. So it doesn't look like anything new is happening, but what it's doing now is it's calling draw over and over and over and over and over. But that allows us to tweak what draw is doing so that each time it draws again, something could happen. So to do that, let's make a definition of a ball. And instead of having some magic numbers like we have here, we're going to define those. We're just going to move those magic numbers for now. OK, great. We can see a lot of progress here, can't we? So it's drawing. One common thing that you do if you're building a game, for example, or any type of animation, is you start dealing with velocities and accelerations. So I'm going to have this ball store its own velocity. So I'm going to say x velocity is 1, y velocity is also 1. So in a positive direction, Technically, it should move there. So we can say, draw the circle, and then do um, So if we do that, well, there we go. It's drawn. Great. We just took the paintbrush and slid it, slid it along. We can do the same thing here with y and y velocity. It's actually still drawing. It's going and going and going. It's just off canvas. So that's kind of annoying. And it's also annoying that it's just a big smudge. So what we'll do is we'll start by clearing before we draw anything. And there you go. You probably almost missed it. But it's drawing, clearing, drawing again. We, that gives us the sensation of the ball moving. So one thing that I forgot to mention was that you should never do this. Set interval is a bad idea in this case. It's, not, it's really inefficient. And uh, you're probably going to draw an update way too much, way too frequently. So there is something else that browsers can offer us now. And that's request animation frame. Request animation frame is essentially doing the same thing, but it's, a, it's deferring to the browser, saying, you let me know when it's the best time to animate something. So it's a lot more efficient. So I'm calling it here, and then it, it has to kind of recursively call and call and call in order to make the animation go. So you can see it's actually a little bit smoother there if we increase the velocity a bit. So it's kind of annoying that it just goes right off the screen. Let's fix that. We're going to do some if statements. Let's say if the ball dot y. So the y of the ball is right the middle of the ball. So if we say the ball y coordinate plus its radius is greater than stage height, then let's take the ball y velocity and set it to negative ball velocity. 
There we go. So it bounced off the bottom. It's still going off into space on the other side. So we'll repeat this a few more times. If ball.x plus ball radius, the right side of the ball, is greater than stage width. I'm going to copy this because it's so similar. Then we'll change the x velocity to negative x velocity. So, you know, we're, it's pretty simple algorithm here. It's just saying, I'm just going to keep adding the velocity, whatever that is. And then we're saying, nope, switch that when something happened. OK, if ball dot, uh, let's see, let's go off the top. So if the ball y minus the ball radius is less than 0, ball dot y velocity equals positive velocity. OK, one side left. If ball dot x minus ball radius is less than zero, all right, let's see if it worked. There we go, bouncing ball, everything that dreams are made of. <laughs> Thank you. There's more. There's more. It's, it's going to be great. It's, it gets better. Okay, so this is kind of annoying. I mean, what if I want more than one ball? Well, I could just copy and paste about 15 more times, right? Or we could do something cool. So what I'd like to do, ideally, is say new ball, for example, up here, and then down here, Every time it gets through this update loop, we'll call ball.update and ball.draw. This is actually a very common pattern if you're building a game uh, like this, because this is a game, uh, where the update method is going to update the state of the object. The draw method is going to deal strictly with drawing it. So in our, this is not going to work yet. So what we'll do is we will change this to a function. And let's see. I'll replace a few things. OK, so we've got our ball definition as is. Let's say ball.prototype function and ball type draw the function. I told you it was vanilla JavaScript, didn't I? This is great. Love it. OK, so now what we need to do is take this logic we wrote here and actually put it into the ball. The ball should behave itself. So we'll take this drawing line and put it in the draw method. I'm going to change ball to this because it's a property of this instance. And then if we take. This is mostly the state change logic. So we'll pull that out of there as well. Put that in update. So update is going to just update the state of the ball and the velocity. This is refactoring, guys. Sweet. I would write tests, but that's boring. So we'll stick with this. OK, think it'll work? Crossing my fingers. Let's save that. See, once again, making so much progress. Still works. 
looks exactly the same. So one thing we could do to spice it up here is let's have the ball start on a random x coordinate. I've imported at the top here a low dash random method. You've probably all used it before. It allows you to specify a minimum and a maximum, and then it picks a, picks a value in between. So in this case, I want it to be random on the x-axis, starting, keeping in mind the radius, at about the radius. So we'll say this.radius. Speaking of that, let's move this up as the min, and then stage width minus radius for the max. That ought to do it. Let's make the radius random, too. Random from, say, 5 to 5, 4. And then, so 5 to 20. We'll see if that did anything. Look at that. It's a small ball. Nice. So we've got something going on. Let's do the same treatment for the y coordinate. Oops. So now you can see it kind of randomly positions itself and gives it a random size on the stage. Let's make the velocity random. I mean, random is just, this feels right, doesn't it? <laughs> wow, it's too fast. Two to ten. Two to eight. I mean, I can't take the speed, guys. Okay, and then lastly, I have written a. Oh, you know what? I also wrote another thing. Um, random negative. This is so. What we had before was it would always be a positive random x and y velocity. Passing in this little random negative multiplier, it's going to give it a random negative. Maybe it will be negative, maybe it will be positive. And so the ball could potentially go in, in and see how it went to the left that time. Tr truly random. And then orange gets a little dull. So get, what do they call it? Random course. Random hex color. Okay, I had to refresh it a few times. I'm colorblind, so I was hoping it was changing. Looks like it is. It's great. Perfect. Okay, so now we've got the scaffolding all set up just in time because now we can start repeating ourselves and make ball one, ball two, ball three. That's, that's not recommended. Instead, we could create an actor's array and instantiate a, a whole bunch of balls in here. And then down here, we can say, um, for each actor in this array, call update and draw. And there we go. Look at that. <laughs> so, you know, it's nice. We can instantiate. Any, however many balls we want. So let's, you know, crank it up. Yes. Screensaver, people. This is great. And we can get it even more. So you can see, actually, performance is OK. If I'm 1,000 objects all at once dancing around, if I crank that up to you know, 5,000, it's not so good. So there are limits with Canvas. So. There you go. Okay, I know I just have a few minutes. Just give me two minutes. 
And let me finish this presentation. That, so now you know everything you need to know about Canvas. Pat yourself on the back. OK, just kidding. There's a lot more. But now you've got a taste. So here's a little uh, homework for you if you're interested. There's some frameworks and libraries out there. Uh, EaselJS is a great one. All of these are interesting. Uh, game engines. Impact is a very popular one. And then if you're interested in reading more about Canvas, the, this book is a great one, Core HTML5 Canvas. There's a YouTube video deep, uh, diving deep into Canvas. Highly recommend. And if you're into React, I know it's a four-letter word here too, I'm sorry. But they have a React Canvas, which will render re a React app to a Canvas, which is pretty cool. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Uh, these are the URLs if you want to get these, uh, this slide deck, a bit.ly link there, so you can get to all those things I skimmed over. And if you'd like to toy around with the example that I just built, you can find that on my GitHub. I know we're out of time, but are there any quick questions before we end? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so I'm Maureen. Um, I'm a recent Utah transplant. I'm working at Plural Site now, but before that, I was living in San Francisco up until a couple months ago, working at a company called CNE Media. And when I was at my company, we basically decided to rebuild everything that we had. The company had been around since '96. They had a bunch of junk. They're like, okay, cool, let's scrap it all, let's rebuild it all. But for my component of it, they gave us no design resources. So I had this team full of. It was I'm a JavaScript dev. And there was two other uh, Java devs um, writing a brand new thing in Node with no designers. And we were told, OK, make it work like the old one, but prettier. And what did prettier mean? We weren't really all that sure. So we looked into options. We'd already decided on Angular as our front end technology. And we came across Material, which is Google's design framework uh, that they use to, uh, that they have created to have a unified style experience across different platforms. And since it's integrated well with Angular, it seemed like a good choice. And so that's kind of my caveat of like, a lot of designers aren't designing for material. It kind of only makes sense if you have, um, if you want to make something look good without needing to put in that much time into design work. So what Angular material it would be basically just an Angular implementation of the material design, um, design practices. So it provides a set of reusable components, um, services and directives for Angular that can be used uh, to implement the design practices. So I am starting off with a little brief overview of material design. There's obviously a ton. The design docs are super good. Um, and so you can look into those. Uh, but this just to so have a little bit of an overview of what's going on. The basic principles of, mat of material are that it was based around pen and paper. So you have this sheet of paper. It exists. It has a physical space, a physical presence. It can't move through other elements. Uh, the ink on the page is there. It's not going to like automatically disappear without some kind of reason to do so. There's also a focus on bold icons and bold designs uh, with, this, with the design principle around print, uh, print practices. Just like you'd not put up a flyer with black 
black text on a white sheet, no one reads your flyer. You want it to be bold. You want it to be exciting. So their icon practices are involved in that. And then also in material, all motion has meaning. So how many times have you loaded a page and like this falls in from over here, and then there's like this little swivel here, and you're like, but there's still principles of gravity that should exist. So in material, like something might spark an action over here on the page, and so that action will move up from that corner. It won't just come in magically from somewhere else on the screen. So all the motion has meaning triggered off of your practices. So similar to that, there's an XY. This is for an Android phone, obviously, but um, the Angular applications for web. Um, but they have the x, y, and z coordinates. Every material or every element that you create has a depth, but the depth is always one deep pixel. So it's always a fixed depth, and it'll have a height off the page, and the shadows will be according to that height. This, the sun is always from this side, so the shadow is according to that, and how high it is is the size of the shadow. And the cool thing about um, Angular Material is that if you create the elements using their system, it does all those shadows for you because no one really wants to write every little CSS line to create a bunch of shadows for a bunch of different heights and all of that. So that's all done. So I, all, I put my link to the slides on GitHub. It's actually, my slides are running as an Angular Material app, so I'm not ambitious enough to live code, but everything is running material in the slides. Um, so there's a link to the docs there if you can get them off of GitHub, and uh, the full docs are there. But the layout uses Flexbox. Um, so I guess if you're supporting IE8, you are in trouble. Uh, but the basic Flexbox practices involving rows, layouts, um, if you want to wrap, this one would wrap around. For some reason, my text editor is adding, if I didn't have anything after something, it adds the equals blank, which is annoying. Um, but that's highlight JS. It decided it wants to. So you see that, assume there's nothing there. Um, and so yeah, this is all running Flexbox. And then if you want to, oh, well, that's not my line. But um, you can also add the margins between the layout margin and put the margin in the order. You can assign orders to things. If you gave it a flex order of three, like this is my first element in my markup, and it is my last element here. So you can assign the orders in that way just with this syntax. Ah, oh, well, or I can just delete things. And escape from my presentation. Good. <laughs> Uh, you know, best laid plans, right? Okay. So in the style guide, it also has set colors for theming. I think I skipped a couple slides, but let me find where I was again. Nope, I didn't. Uh, so you have um, colors for theming. There's a ton of palettes, and you can assign the palettes uh, to your project, and it'll have all these hues accessible to you. I use it, the material color palette, if I'm just designing a site not in material, because it gives you a good set of colors that match each other. Uh, and look good together and have a logical flow, but there's always the, this, the top shades would always be your primary hues, and there's the middles and secondaries, but you can call each of them when you lay out your uh, themes. So when you're doing your basically basic material setup, you can create these theming providers and create a default theme. You can have multiple different themes. You can even create a custom theme, introduce your own set of colors. Let's say your company has a specific brand that isn't in the material colors. You could create a custom uh, theming palette through those and assign your own values to those hues, the 100, 200, 300. And you'll be able to call those um, using like a prime, uh, like MD primary, MD secondary, uh, assigning colors that way as styles. So it also provides some layout tools. Um, the top bars are toolbars here. I was starting out searching header, and I can come up with a header. It's a toolbar. Um, so this would be your toolbar at the top of the screen. It would be obviously up here. Uh, and then you can have these side navs, because one of the principles of material design is that it wants you to have the similar components that you'd have on web and in mobile, so that experience is unified across the board. So a lot of the elements would involve swipe on your phone if you're using it on a mobile site, but on the web you would use a button or you could um, use some kind of toggle to open and close those elements. So this is a very standard left nav swipe that I should have given a background color to. But yeah, so and then these setups all involve these. And you can call them using your, like this one is opening via a click function that I have in my controller for this application. So all the elements can be called like that. And I can just delete things. And then they use a grid layout. One of my favorite things about Material is the grid list, where you, this is a really basic implementation of the grid list. But I could, in my controller, have set up a list that has um, each tile being assigned a random height and width. And I would end up with a very random grid uh, that can be called with just this MD grid list. Um, just, uh, so this is giving a row is, has each box has a height of 3 by 4. So this is my 3 axis and my 4 axis. The gutter is 1 EM, and there's five rows per column. So that assign, establishes that list, but then the dimensions of the tiles can be altered uh, in your controller. And I need to stop doing that. 
Uh, and so then the directives associated with Angular Material, there's a bunch of them. I'm just going to give you guys kind of a highlight reel of some of the more useful ones. The buttons, if you look at the buttons, they also have that motion has a meaning. If you look when I click, it's really subtle, but the motion comes from the point in the box where I click on. Oh, that broke. But this one does, so it's from in the center because I was on that side or whatever. So those can all be called, and this is an example of how you use the different colors. This is my primary, this is my warning color, or my accent color and my warning, because in that first slide I assigned my, my primary color is blue and my accent is pink. So those have carried through, and then you have your warnings here. Uh, warning defaults to orange in all of the apps, whether or not you set it. Actually, primary defaults to pink and secondary to orange. I'm not sure why those are really abrasive colors, but um, they do. And so, yeah, all the buttons are set up like that, and they have the little click actions on them. And you can also have a solid box or a box with a border or whatever. And there's material calls for all of them. This is the basic implementation. Inputs, there's a bunch of cool inputty stuff. Uh, all the inputs do this. Unless you're using an autocomplete input, and then it looks really different. And I'm not sure because the autocomplete one, in my mind, looks a lot better. Uh, it involves like, your more of your standard input box with the rounded edges. This one, if you have it on a black background, a big limitation is these ones on a black background look like a floating line. You're like, OK, what do I do with that? Uh, so actually, material, that's something to note. They do have a dark background that you can put in your theming provider. But that dark background is a gray, because a lot of these elements involve having space on paper, and you can't see the shadows against a black background. So if you need to have a black background in your application, this is not a great framework to use, uh, because you lose all those, those vertical heights and the depths that we were talking about. So that's a big limitation. So, um, but the checkboxes, like this one, has a true and false value that's set with my ng model. And just a standard checkbox uh, goes away when it's not there. There's inputs. These are just radio buttons. Nothing too fancy. But the color of this one is set to be the MD primary. So my radio button is blue versus the pink on the rest of them. And then there's switches. You can have, I mean, these are all pretty you know, HTML switches, but they are pretty. And they have the little click functions on them, too. They have that same material motion that they're really focused around and that same set of elements that you have. Oh, and um, if you mark one as disabled, it just kind of grays it out. This one can't be clicked, uh, so it's a disabled button. Lots of progress indicators. Uh, you can set all kinds of different things on these. Maybe you want it to buffer along a certain range, value of 30, like in this one, it would know what, what value complete was, and it would load along that range. Just spinning ones, and indeterminately spinning determinate lengths, uh, all of those set up built into the framework. Uh, especially the um, animation stuff from Angular Material. I find this slide kind of blinding to look at, so I'm going to change off of it. But uh, the, the animations are much better in Chrome. Everything is much stronger in Chrome because Angular and Material are both managed by Google, and so that is where their emphasis is. There is some browsers for older IEs that the animations will look a little choppy and they'll look a little rough. But in Chrome, it's great, so if you know that's where most of your user base is. Makes a lot of sense for that. So then now things, the little services and the applications involved with those. So there's the bottom sheets, which you see a lot in your phones. People have their social icons down here. This is a really lame one. But you have, might cut out your social icons, and people can slide them down, swipe them down, or they can just get rid of them. You see they're all, they all work with mouse touch automatically without me adding anything. And this function just kind of calls it. And it's based on a template. But if you want to have your template be more complex, your template could involve a full form down there. Maybe you want to. Bring that up when someone clicks a button on your page and initiates a form from the bottom of the screen. So those bottom sheets are really useful for that. Uh, uh, the alerts are actually a huge plus. Um, for some reason, this JavaScript framework I used didn't carry my font over when I um, did this. And honestly, I just didn't debug it. But the inputs are nice. Uh, they automatically open and close from like in a normal fashion. They have some preset styling. You can incorporate a lot of different elements, and, and they can chain. You could have one alert chaining to another alert. This one's just calling the show alert function. But it can be a promise in, in the promise chain. It can then further call a, a, another alert. Maybe you say yes or no, and it pulls up a form according to what you answered next, or whatever your actions are. Or you can initiate a bottom sheet based on what they did, or another series of the Angular events in promise chaining off of these form events, um, or alert events. There's this is just a basic alert uh, dialog, but there's also a yes or no kind of one that's default of the box. And then you can standard, you can custom write any of them uh, if you don't like, if you don't, if you want something more than just an alert or a dialog. 
then you can custom write any of your templates, use them to convey information. Maybe you click on this thumbnail and it brings up a larger version of the thumbnail. You can use alerts for any of that kind of behavior. And then toasts. I love toasts. I think they're cool. I didn't make them stack, but you could, if I had a three toasts, they'd all raise each other up, and then you could have them close on timeouts. But they're kind of a different way to convey information that people are getting used to seeing. Instead of having a bar across saying 500 server error, you can convey that in a toast, and people can dismiss it, or giving the information you were successfully authenticated. And it's just a little bit of a different way to uh, portray information. If I want to put an X button here to close it out, that would be an option, or this one automatically closes. Um, I think my, it's set up to be five seconds. Uh, Maybe less, that seems less. But so those are all set up that way um, to open and close, and they can stack and they can nest. Uh, and there's a bunch of different types of them. You can actually write your own service to convey toast. So maybe you have an error handling service to like send toast based on that 500 error, 400 error, uh, a success event, uh, create, break that out into its own service and run all of your toasts out of that. So it'll automatically, maybe you're just calling mdtoast.success and uh, it will automatically give you a green one that says, good job, you're winning. And so this is just a very, I think I talked too fast, but this is a very high level view of Angular material. Uh, and so there's obviously a ton more stuff involved in the documentation. It's all pretty straightforward, reusable components. And I highly recommend if you're going to get started, that you read the style guide first. I think one of the big cons of it is you can still throw together an ugly application using material. It's not hard. I've done it a million times. And so if you look through the style guide, it gives you information on everything from how to write your words. Like always say your account versus my account because the application doesn't have an account. Why, does it, why is it referring to its own account? And like little explanations like that for everything. How to design your icons. How to pick your colors based on your content types. Like crazy amounts of thought went into the documentation for this. And so it's actually super great. I was looking through and I didn't have a ton to present other than the stuff that they give you because they do it pretty well. Um, and so I'd say like major pros are you're able to convey information to people uh, in a stylized way that works across mobile to desktop without any input from a designer, without any need for that product side of it. Uh, but not every company wants that brand. If you do a full material app, it ends up looking like your Google inbox. That's just the reality of it. I love it. I use it for everything. I like how my Google inbox looks. But that is something you should know. Is it's hard to avoid that kind of general style uh, with it. And black backgrounds are a huge limitation. Uh, my previous company, they loved black backgrounds. That was their brand. And selling them on, we should have a gray background, took me like probably as much time as writing most of the application. <laughs> so. I mean, it's a great framework. It's really reusable. The parts of it are reusable. And you can pick different, pick and choose. Like maybe you don't want to use the layouts and the headers, but you need the toast and the alerts. You can pick and choose what you take from it. And I think it's awesome. Does anyone have questions? I talked way too fast. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, I mean, any of Google stuff does. Like, if you've opted into Inbox or any of that, uh, we have, my, my previous company has a live video streaming platform that does kind of online education and teaching that's in material. Major other ones, not so much because major brands kind of don't want to be associated with Google's brand from what I've seen, but. I haven't seen any actually using Angular Material. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I've seen people use Material Design Practices. There's also Polymer is the alternative. Uh, material Design Practice, but existential. I can send you some. I'm sure I can find some, but I'm not sure offhand. Okay. Yes. No, it's kind of more of an all or nothing thing. Uh, you can obviously like strip out the CSS from material CSS style if you wanted to, but no, they don't have it broken up in components. It's you, you bring down material as a whole. Yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, my company mostly provides like the backends for different platforms. The only one I can directly link you to is an adult streaming service, so I don't think I should give that out loud. <laughs> but. Uh, Good cam girl site in Angular Material. <laughs> so.
<laughs> but they have, they, I don't know if uh, other customers are using the front ends for it. <laughs> I haven't actually ever tried. I can't speak to it, I'm sorry. Cool. Thanks, guys.